God's house this morning. I appreciate each and every one that's with us today, especially those of you that are visiting. Uh, we've come that we might worship the one that is worthy. Uh, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is to be lifted up in this place and in every place. His name is to be exalted. I hope that you'll help us to do that today. I uh, want to say to those that are visiting, we're glad that you come to be with us at Batley. Uh, you chose this church. Of all the churches that you could have went to, you came here, and we're honored. And we're glad that you chose Batley to come and worship in. I uh, also want to say this. This morning during the Sunday school hour, if you want to know the reason that Dean got beside himself today, is his grandson Josh uh, came into my office. Me and Lee was there, and uh, he bowed his head, and he asked Jesus to forgive him of his sins. And, and uh, the prodigal came home, and we're glad of that. And so let me say, in just a few minutes, we're going to be having fellowship. Uh, why don't you just come around and let Josh know that you're thankful that he has uh, asked the Lord to forgive him and, and that you're going to be praying for him. We're, Josh, we're here for you. Love you, buddy. And we're just asking God to help you in the days ahead. Uh, but we're going to receive our offering. So if you'll stand at this time, we're going to ask the blessing upon the offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be in this place. And Lord, especially for he, the Holy Spirit, that has come. And Lord, give us a, a, just a welcome. Father, I pray today that we'll do everything that you ask us to do. Lord, we ask this morning that your name will be lifted up. Lord, help me, Father, to uh, just get anything out of my mind that would hinder me from focusing upon you. And Lord, help me this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we thank you for Josh. We thank you, Lord, this morning that he's asked you to forgive him. And Lord, we ask that you'll be with him in the days ahead. And for others that are in this building today that need to do the same thing, Lord, we ask that you'll speak to their heart, draw them to a place of repentance so that they, like Josh, can leave here today knowing that their sins have been forgiven. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all that you do for us. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Remain standing and help the choir to sing.
long I had searched for life's meaning Enslaved by the world and my greed Then the door of the prison was opened by love For the ransom was paid I was free, I'm free from the fear of tomorrow, I'm free from the guilt of the past, for I've traded my shackles for a glorious song, I'm free, praise the Lord. Free at last, I'm free from the guilt that I carried, from that dull, empty life I'm set free, for when I met Jesus, He made me complete, He forgot how foolish I used to be. I'm free from the fear of tomorrow. I'm free from the guilt of the past. For I've traded my shackles for a glorious song. I'm free, praise the Lord, free at last. Oh, I'm free from the fear of tomorrow. I'm free from the guilt of the past. For I've traded my shackles for a glorious song. I'm free, praise the Lord, free at last. Yes, I'm free, praise the Lord, free at last. Amen. Thank you, Lonnie. The Bible says, whom the Lord is made free is free indeed. Uh, I used to misquote that. I used to say, whom the Lord has set free, but that's not what it says. Whom the Lord has made free. And there's a difference in being made free and being set free. I'm glad I've been made free. By the creator of all things has made me free through the blood of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, we're looking at Zechariah. Uh, if you have a trouble finding that, go to, go to the book of Matthew and turn left about five or six pages probably in your Bible and you'll come to the book of Zechariah, uh, Zechariah chapter number three and we're going to be looking at verses one through seven. Uh, would you stand with me this morning as we give honor and reverence to the reading of God's word? I'm preaching on the subject, standing in the courtroom of God. Uh, we're all this morning uh, in judgment before the Lord. God is going to judge each one of us for what we do here today. He's going to judge us mainly about what we do with Jesus. And so all of us in that sense, we're in the courtroom of God. Let's look in God's word together. The Bible says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fire mitre upon his head. So they set a fire mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among them, them that stand by. Father, we ask today that you'll use us, Father, to preach this message. 
And Lord, I ask that every heart, every mind will be in tune to what you have to say. Lord, I ask today that you'll speak to those that don't know you as their Savior and to those that know you, Lord, but yet have found themselves afar off. And Lord, I pray that you'll draw them back to you. Bless those that are discouraged, those that have problems that uh, just seemingly, they're just unsurmountable. Lord, I pray that you'll remind them that your grace is sufficient to meet every need. And Lord, for all that you say to us and all that you do for us, Lord, we'll give you the thanksgiving and praise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, this is a, a very interesting piece of scripture, and uh, there's a few characters that are mentioned here. First of all, Joshua the high priest. Now, this is not the Joshua uh, the, in the book of Joshua. This is Joshua the high priest, and he's the high priest in a time that is very uh, devastating in the life of the nation of Israel. They've been taken into captivity. And there are many that will say, that have said concerning Israel, that they'll never rise back up again. And yet God says that they're like a brand that has been plucked out of the burning. Uh, God restores them. We know the rest of the story. God brings them back into the land. So we find Joshua the high priest. He's on trial. And then the Bible says that there's also the angel of the Lord. And uh, whenever you begin to look in Scripture, you'll discover that many times the angel of the Lord is none other than the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that's exactly who the Bible is talking about here. And then thirdly, we find the prosecuting attorney, Satan. The Bible says he is standing at his right hand to resist Joshua. And that word resist literally means to accuse. He's the accuser. Every person this morning that has ever been born of a woman has an appointment with death. We also have an appointment with God. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 says, It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. Our body has an appointment with death. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, For dust thou art, and into dust shalt thou return. Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. And so we discover, uh, just from reading the Word of God, and by looking around from experience, we know that we have an appointment with death. Our body has an appointment with death. And then our soul has an appointment with God. When man stands in the courtroom of God and the verdict is passed, there's no court of appeal. One day, everyone is going to have to stand before the Lord. The Bible teaches us that God is the judge of all men, the judge of all eternity. But in God's courtroom, it's different than the courtrooms that we have today. First of all, there's no juries. And secondly, there's no arguments. There's just a judge and the defendant. And unless you have secured an attorney while you're living, then, dear friend, there'll be no attorney for you when you die. And if you do qualify for a defense attorney, the defense attorney is none other than the judge himself. I know that's a little bit confusing. And I hope this morning to be able to bring uh, this into light so that we can understand what uh, God has given me to say. In Zechariah, we stand uh, uh, as witnesses to the courtroom of eternity. The first thing that I want you to notice about this courtroom is the guilt of the sinner. The guilt of the sinner, the settling of these verses, the setting of this verse is in a courtroom. Jo God's the judge. Joshua the high priest is the defendant. And Satan is the prosecuting attorney. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may give an account of the things done in his body, whether they be good or whether they be evil. In this particular scripture, Satan is bringing his case against Joshua before God. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a religious leader, you're a political leader, you're a military leader. Everyone is going to have to stand before God. The Bible says that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's many that think that they have all power, but there's just one that has all power, and that's God himself. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 6, verse 15 through 17, that one day those that have resisted God and the kings of the earth and the rich men and the great men and the chief captains and the mighty men, every bondsman, every freeman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. Uh, for the that great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Here Satan is bringing his case against Joshua before God. Verse number 1, he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him or to accuse him. After Satan gets you to sin, that's his 
But that's his uh, lifelong goal is to get us to sin, to tempt us to sin. But once he gets us to do that, then he does what he does here with Joshua. He proceeds to slander us and to accuse us. Somebody has said this, Satan will cripple you and then blame you for limping. Satan will push you in the mud and then blame you for getting dirty. He's the accuser of the brethren. According to Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 10, John said, I heard a great voice, a loud voice in heaven. Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brother is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Satan is merciless when it comes to accusing us before God. He loves to get us to sin, and then he loves to point out our sin after we sin. He's the accuser of the brethren. He'll tell us how enjoyable sin is, and then when we've taken the bait, he'll come right back and taunt us because we have sinned. Now be sure this morning, in this particular scripture, Satan had the goods on Joshua. There's no doubting, there's no denying, Joshua is guilty as charged because we read in verse number 3, now Joshua is clothed with filthy garments. Joshua's not trying to defend himself. He can't. He's guilty. He has no defense. When Satan says to the Lord, he is guilty, he's not lying. Joshua is guilty. Now, we do know that Satan is a liar and he's the father of a lie. But when Satan accuses us before God of being sinners, we might as well say amen because that's exactly what we are. Romans 3 and 23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The best person that you know... That godly grandmother that uh, read you the Bible, that prayed for you, she was a sinner. That preacher that introduced you to the Lord Jesus Christ, he was a sinner. Every person in this building, I'm talking about from the oldest to the youngest, from the richest to the poorest, every person in this building is a sinner. We've all sinned. We all come short of the glory of God. By the way, Satan has been accusing folks as long as there's been time. When Noah got drunk, Satan came before God accusing him. When Abraham lied about his wife uh, being his sister, Satan was there to accuse him. When Jacob deceived his father Isaac, Satan was the accuser. When David committed adultery with Sheba, then had her husband Uriah killed in the heat of the battle, Satan was there to accuse. When Peter began to curse and deny that he even knew the Lord, Satan was there to accuse him. In fact, Jesus warned Peter in in Luke chapter 21 and verse 31. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have thee that he may sift thee as wheat. He was there to accuse Peter. But I'm glad for the rest of the story because Jesus went on to say, but I have prayed for you. I'm glad this morning that I've got a Savior that knows my weaknesses, that knows my sins, and even at this very moment is at the right hand of his Father praying for this preacher. Oh, dear friend, when when Simon sinned and when Noah sinned, I can just imagine the devil saying, did you see what he did? Uh, Did you, uh, and he's supposed to love you. He's supposed to be one of your servants. Did you see what he did? Satan is the accuser of the brother. Joshua's facing the same situation that we all face. He is filthy. He's dirty. He's sinful and he's guilty. He knows it. Satan knows it. And God knew it. Years ago when I was pastor of my first church, there was a black preacher in our community. And uh, there was a man in his church that had got into some meanness. And one morning, the pastor got before the church. True story. And this is what he said. He said, there's somebody in this church that's done wrong. He said, I know what you did. God knows what you did. We're going to give you a chance to repent. And if you don't repent, the whole church is going to know what you did. (laughs) Dear friend, everybody uh, but knew what he had done. This morning... Uh, as I think about the accusation of Satan and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, there is a difference. There's a big difference. Satan and the Holy Spirit, they use guilt, but they use it in a different way. For instance, Satan uses guilt to tear us down. The Holy Spirit uses guilt to cleanse us. Satan uses guilt to condemn us. The Holy Spirit uses guilt to convict us. Satan uses guilt to bring us to ruin. The Holy Spirit uses guilt to bring us to redemption and to repentance. When we look at Peter and Judas, for instance, they both were guilty. 
Peter denied the Lord. Uh, uh, Judas uh, sold out the Lord. Both of these men fell prey to Satan's temptation. But the outcome of these two disciples were as different as day and night. Satan entered into Judas and, and led him to betray the Lord. And once he betrayed the Lord, Satan uses that to ruin Judas. Judas became very sorrowful. The Bible says that he wept. And, and, uh, but dear friend, there's a difference between godly sorrow and earthly sorrow. Judas had earthly sorrow. You can weep a river of tears. But dear friend, if your heart is not turned toward God in the matter of repentance and being sorry, then all those tears mean nothing. The Bible says godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation. Godly sorrow brings conviction. The sorrow of the world brings accusation and death. Satan wants you to feel guilty. All of us have sinned. One of the things that Christians need to be aware of is this. If you're not awful careful, you'll get to the point that even though God has forgiven you, you have a hard time forgiving yourself. And Satan uses that because as long as he can get us to focus on the wrong that we've done, the sin that we've committed, we're not much use to the kingdom of God. But if we can just realize that our sins, once they've been forgiven by Jesus Christ, they're gone as far as the east is from the west. God has removed our transgressions from us. If we can just get a hold of that, dear friend, and realize that all of our sins are under the blood, then we ought to be able to go forward with God. Oh, dear friend, if, the, if Satan get a Christian to feel guilty and forget that his sins have been forgiven, he's got him right where he wants him. Satan uses these steps to hinder your Christian walk and rob you of the joy of your salvation. First of all, he'll tempt us. And by the way, being tempted is not a sin. Yielding to temptation is. The Bible says there hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. That means that what you're being tempted with, everybody has been tempted with. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that that you're able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. God always has a way of escape. And so Satan, first of all, he tempts us, and then secondly, he trips us and causes us, if we're not awful careful, to fall into sin. And then he traps us, does everything possible that he can do to keep us trapped in our sin, and then he taunts us. After that, he has led us to sin. He's tempted us to sin. He's trapped us in sin. Then he stands back and he accuses us before God and says, look what he's done. Look what she's done. So we see the guilt of the sinner. I'm glad this morning that the story doesn't stop there. Secondly, I want you to notice that the grace of the Savior. Joshua didn't say anything. In this whole conversation, Joshua never opened his mouth. You know the reason? He doesn't have a defense. But look who comes to his rescue in verse number 10. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? This battle is not Joshua's to fight. This battle belongs to the Lord. I'm glad the battle still belongs to God. When, when David went out to face Goliath in the valley of Elah, the Bible says that he said to the people in 1 Samuel 17 and 47, the battle is the Lord's. Are you being tempted? Are you being tested this morning? Is the devil accusing you? Then give the battle to the Lord. The battle is the Lord's. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles uh, 20 and verse number 15 that when King Jehoshaphat was facing an enemy that he couldn't possibly defeat, he went before the Lord and he prayed and he said, I'm small and I don't know what to do. But about that time, God sent a preacher. And the Bible says that the preacher began to say to him, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of the multitude that is against you. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. For the battle is not yours, but God's. And then we read in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 7, 8, King Hezekiah where the Bible says that be strong and courageous, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of the multitude that is with him, for there is more, uh, more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. When the devil tempts you, let God fight your battles. We're at war with the devil, but it's not our war to win. The battle is the Lord's. 
God never defends the sins of his children, but he defends his children. He always stands up for his children. And then something amazing happens in this courtroom scene. The judge becomes the defense attorney. The Bible says that our judge this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 John chapter 2, verse number 1, My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not, but if you do sin, you have an advocate, you have a lawyer. You have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The defense attorney that came to defend Joshua is the same one that came to defend me on Good Friday, 1973. When I was lost in my sins, condemned, and the accuser of the brother Satan was reminding me of how bad that I was. But then the Holy Spirit reminded me of how good God is. And he took my case and he defended me. I'm glad this morning that I have a defense attorney. It was the Lord that defended Joshua. Notice this, Joshua didn't rebuke the devil. The Lord rebuked the devil. Every now and then I'll hear folks on the radio or on TV, they'll say something like this. All you've got to do is just holler boo at the devil and he'll run off and leave you. Let me say this morning, Satan is not a 90-pound weakling. His power is second only to God. And as God's people, we better recognize he has great power, but I'm glad he doesn't have all power. God has all power. You're asking for more trouble than you can ever handle if you underestimate the power of Satan. Buddy, he's got great power. Theodore Roosevelt had a little dog that was always getting in a fight with other dogs. Somebody came to him one day and said, Mr. President, your dog's not much of a fighter, is he? And President Roosevelt said, oh, yes, he's a good fighter. He's just a poor judge of dogs. A lot of Christians are a poor judge of the power of Satan. But you can't mess around with him. We're, told, uh, we're not told to fight the devil. We're told to resist the devil. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But you cannot resist the devil until first you submit yourself to God. Give it to God. Let the Lord fight your battles. Even Michael the archangel... Wouldn't go against Satan by himself. Jude, verse number 9, said, Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Even Michael, the archangel, as powerful as he is, did not resist the devil in his own power, but he said, The Lord rebuke thee. Dear friend, remember that the battle is the Lord's. Don't you try to fight the devil in the power of your own flesh. We can't fight the devil. We're not expected to. When the devil hauls you into God's courtroom, let your lawyer do your talking. Just be quiet and let him speak. You know that old Miranda thing, you have the right to be silent when it comes to the accusation of the devil. Make sure you exercise your right. You be silent. Let God do the talking. The, de- the Lord rebuked the old devil. Oh, dear friend, when Satan rebuked Joshua, Joshua had nothing to say. But when God rebuked the devil, the devil didn't have anything to say. Martin Luther used to be very descriptive about his battles with the devil. In fact, one day his wife came in, and there was a big ink splot across the wall. And she asked him, said, what happened, uh, Martin? He said, well, said, I thought I saw the devil, and I threw the well, ink well against the wall. I threw it at him. But another time he said this. When somebody asked him, said, how do you overcome the devil? Martin Luther said, well, he said, when he comes knocking at the door of my heart and he asks who lives here, I say, the dear Lord Jesus, I allow him to go to the door and say, Martin Luther used to live here, but he moved out and I've moved in. And when the devil sees the nail prints in his hands, in his pierced side, he takes flight and he runs off and leaves me. When the devil comes knocking, let Jesus open the door. When the devil tempts you, let Jesus do the answering. Joshua was guilty. All the evidence is against him. And yet something wonderful happens in this courtroom scene. God, the righteous judge, declares him not guilty. I believe this morning, whenever the devil begins to accuse us before God, 
The Lord Jesus Christ raises those nail-scarred hands and says, on the basis of what I've done for him at Calvary, I declare him not guilty. Notice some wonderful things happened to Joshua in the courtroom of God. First of all, he was cleansed. We're told in verse 3, now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. By the way, that word filthy in the Hebrew language, it's a very crude word. It means this, to be covered with human waste. He is filthy. His garments are not only dirty, they're smelly. You realize a sin is a stench in the nostrils of a holy God? And this morning, the judge orders these filthy garments removed. Verse 4, he answered and spake unto those that stood by him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. Is that not what the Lord did for you when he saved you? Remove those filthy garments. There was a stench in the nostrils of a holy God. Just like he said uh, concerning the prodigal, the prodigal's father said, take off those filthy clothes, bring the best robe, and put it on him. Clothed in the righteousness of God. So he was cleansed. We're told that Joshua was like a brand plucked out of the fire. Every saved person this morning, that's what God did for us. He plucked us out of the fire. God gives you that opportunity today. Isaiah 1.18 says, come now, let us reason together saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So he was cleansed. Secondly, he was clothed. The Bible says in verse 4, Behold, I have caused thy iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. He goes from wearing filthy garments to wearing God's best what the prodigal did been sleeping with the pigs been eating with the pigs been living with the pigs he's smelly he's uh, he's dirty but i'm glad that when he comes to his senses and realizes that these what i need is at the father's house and he came to the father the father took away the stench and the filth and he clothed him in his own clothing that's what the lord did for me when he saved me Remove this old filthy garment of sin that I was wearing and clothe me in the righteousness of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Josh was clothed in God's righteousness. Isaiah 61 and 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. Right there would be a good place to say amen. Right there would be a good place to shout. That's what God's done for us. Harry Ironside told of a visiting a sheep ranch in Texas, and he saw something he just couldn't figure out. He, he saw a little lamb that had four front legs, four back legs, and two heads. He asked the rancher, said, well, what's all this? And the rancher said, well, said, we had a little lamb to die and, and left its mother, and then we had another Mother lamb to die and left her little one. And so what we thought we would do is this. We we thought that uh, since this mother, uh, we tried to get her to feed this little one that lost its mother, and the mother wouldn't have anything to do with it. She just shunned that little lamb. Then we got to thinking, you know, if somehow that mother thought that that was her little lamb, then maybe she would feed it. And so what we did is we skinned that dead little lamb and we put the hide on the little lamb that was still alive and we put her in the pen with the mother that lost her lamb and she thought it was hers. And so she took care of it. Well, dear friend, that's exactly what happened to me when God saved me. I was clothed in the righteousness of God. As Lee said this morning before that, I had no right I had no way that I could approach God because I was still in my filthy garments. But whenever I become clothed in the righteousness of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm now accepted. Uh, My dear friend, I am part of the beloved. And whenever he sees me, he sees me through the blood of his son. The Lord Jesus Christ doesn't see me as what I used to be, but he sees me as what I am now, saved and sanctified, glorified one day. Sees me as his own son. 
Joshua's filthy rags represented his own righteousness. Our own righteousness is his filthy rags. Our own righteousness will not get us to heaven. Before we can be clothed in the righteousness of God, the filthy robes of our own righteousness have to be removed. Joshua was cleansed. Joshua was clothed. And then he was crowned. Verse number 5, And I said, Let them set a fire mitre upon his head. So they set a fire mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. That word fire mitre means clean turban. That was the headpiece of the high priest. He said, you put the garment of the high priest upon him. In fact, in Exodus chapter 38, verse 26, the Bible says that written on that headpiece is this, holy to the Lord. The high priest was able to come and make intercession. He was able to come in fellowship with God. Josh was now back in fellowship with God. He's wearing the garments of a priest. The Bible says in 1 John 1 and 9, I shared this with Josh this morning. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what the Lord does for us. So we see this morning the guilt of the sinner. We, uh, thirdly, we see the glory of the saint. I like the fact that Josh was not put on probation to see if he'll hold out. He's put back in the work of God. Aren't you glad that God doesn't hold our sin against us? I know me better than anybody knows me outside the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know how unworthy, how low down, how filthy, and how deserving of hell that I am. I'm so thankful this morning, though, that when God saved me, he didn't put me on probation. He didn't say, if you hold out, I'll take you to heaven when you die. He's doing the holding out for me. Somebody said, I'm holding on to God. Oh, dear friend, if you're holding on to God, you'll get weary and you'll let go. I'm glad it's God holding on to me. As Paul said, I know in whom I believed and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that that I've committed unto him against that day. So Joshua here, we see the glory of the saint. Psalms 103, verse 10 through 12 says, He's not dealt with us after our sins. He's not rewarded us according to our iniquity. For as high as the heaven is above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Notice the glory of the sight. Joshua reclaimed some things that was lost because of his sin. First of all, he reclaimed his authority with God. Verse 6 and 7, the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways and keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house and shall also keep my courts. Joshua was told that if he would walk in the ways of God, that he could carry on the job of the priest. As long as he was filthy in those filthy rags, those robes of, uh, of filthiness, he had no authority with God, no usefulness for God. By the way, dear friend, as long as our lives are tainted with sin, we have no usefulness to God. There has to be a cleansing that takes place. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He reclaimed his authority with God. And secondly, he reclaimed his access to God. He said, I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Remember where Joshua is right now. He's in the presence of the God of eternity. You know, this morning, there's no way that I can walk with God and have fellowship with him as long as I've got sin in my life. Psalm 66 and 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But as soon as I confess my sin, then I can go and I can have access to the Father. According to Matthew 6 and 6, I can pray to my Father in secret. My Father which sitteth in secret will reward me openly. I'm glad this morning that I have access to God the Father through faith in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, We have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. No matter what you've done, there's a lawyer that's willing to take your case. Advocate. That'll take your case. I wonder this morning, 
as I, I come to the close of this message, I wonder, what's your standing with God? Are you clothed in filthy garments of sin? Has there ever been that time in your life that you asked Jesus Christ to plead your case before the Father? That's the only way that we're ever going to get God's attention. If I go to the Father in my own strength, if I go saying, hey, God, I'm a preacher, that don't carry not one little bit of weight. If I go say, hey, I'm a good Christian, that doesn't get me anywhere else. But if I go in the name of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm glad the gates swing wide open so that he allows me into his presence. Are you dressed in the filthy garments of sin? Would you like to have a change of garments this morning? Would you like to take off the old robe and put on the new? Would you like to be saved by the grace of God, cleansed from your sins? Would you like to leave this building this morning knowing that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life? If you've got a fellowship with God, would you like to know that, that, that everything's all right now between you and God because you have asked God to forgive you? Connie, you come and lead us in a song of invitation. I want us to stand today, and I just want us to examine ourselves. That's what Josh did this morning. Josh, I appreciate your honesty. Josh admitted that I'm a sinner. And me and Lee talked about it. The humbleness as he wept tears, said, I'm a sinner. And I don't want to live the life that I'm living. I'm tired of the life that I've been living. I want this day to be a brand new day for me. I want a new start. And that's what God gave to Josh. And the same God that gave that to Josh this morning wants to give that to you. Wants to give you a brand new start. No matter what you've done. No matter what sin you've committed. The Bible says this morning that Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus, cleanses us from all of our sin. As we sing, why don't you slip out of your seat and come and have a talk with the Lord. We've got folks that are waiting here at this altar to help you to pray, to do anything that they can to help you this morning. Why don't you just slip out of your seat and come while we sing. Search me, oh God. I'm tired of living this life. I'm tired of the accusation of Satan. Why don't you come? Try me, oh Savior, <coughs> know my thoughts, I pray, see if there be some wicked way in me. say this this morning. There's some folks that think that judgment is way out yonder some worse. Do you know what the Bible says about the judgment of God? Judgment begins in the house of God. It's not that you're going to be judged. If you're lost, it's not as though you're going to be condemned. The Bible says because you have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're already condemned. And you're already under the judgment of God in this place this morning. If God has spoken to your heart, God has revealed to you that you're lost. That the garments that you're wearing are filthy garments. Filthy garments of sin. The judgment has already begun for you. Why don't you come and allow that defense attorney, the advocate, the lawyer, the Lord Jesus Christ, to plead your case to the Father, to the judge of all eternity. And I'm glad this morning that when he sees the blood, Everything's all right then. As we sing another verse of a song.